on climate policy is one of the cornerstones of any future global regime. A couple of months ago, I was asked by uh, a German foundation to develop, uh, to write a paper and develop three scenarios. I did it because they asked me to. And only afterwards I discovered that these scenarios are really a very powerful tool. Three scenarios. One, which I called for myself at the beginning, the North Korean scenario. Second one, I called big business scenario. And the third one, I called the paradise scenario. I don't call them like that now, but um, you will soon discover why. North Korea, which is officially called business as usual, so we are not doing anything. The international negotiations fail because the US is not integrating into the regime. In the global south, the leaders are relentlessly defending their own innocence. We haven't done anything. It's you, so you have to act. We have to develop first. Our people are hungry. So there's no agreement in Bali. There's no agreement on post-2012. The um, exploitation of our fossil fuel resources goes on, unhindered. There is no movement. Our, our movement is unsuccessful in dealing with the mainstream consumerist kind of uh, attitude. I mean, my own kids, it's, it's difficult actually to counteract this kind of ideology which is imposed upon them by, by our media. They like big cars. They like shining cars. They like trademarks. They all this kind of stuff. So our movement fails. Emissions rise. Why, why do I call it North Korea? Because it will lead to a society, to a global society, with a very, very small elite of affluent people. Affluent in terms of finances, but also affluent in terms of emission rights. And it will lead to 99% of the global population, which is diminished. It's not the six or nine billion, it's much less. It will lead to 99% of that population living in absolute poverty and misery. On the other side, we've got what I call the eco-fair scenario. Everything works out. Bali is a success. The US agrees to somehow be integrated into the regime. Developing countries' leaders are um, understanding. Yeah, of course, I know. We, you, you cannot do all at once, but we realize that you are goodwilled. So there's an agreement. There is a post-2012 Kyoto II Treaty, or however you will call it. There is um, a rise in, in renewables. You can, with lots of people investing small amounts of money into renewable energy, you can, you can achieve more than large corporations um, investing uh, billions of dollars on their own. So it can be done. And under this scenario, it is being done. There are um, not only pockets of good life, but the, um, a movement for a different kind of life is spreading. Still, under this scenario, I must warn you, we're going to pass the 450 ppm, which is always quoted as being so important, and it is important. But even under these optimistic assumptions we're going to pass, we're going to peak somewhere at 470, 475 parts per million CO2 equivalents. But then emissions go down. So we're going to see major, major changes in our environment, in the global climate. But still, catastrophe might be averted. Second scenario, which I used to call big business, now I call it structurally conservative. So we will at least give the appearance of doing something against climate change. Problem is, we're doing the wrong things at the wrong time. And the biggest danger, I think, of the US entering into the game is exactly that. But the question is, what are we going to do? 
So under this scenario, there is a, um, a, a part, partly a success of the international negotiations. It comes late, so the uh, uh, negotiations are not finalized in 2009. Agreement does not enter into force in 2013, as it should, but in 2014 or 15, which means the markets lose confidence, the global carbon markets, as they are called. We don't like them, but if we would be able to divert these kinds of resources into the right, into wind energy, solar energy, then I think it could make a difference. But in this case, carbon markets break down. Even the EU misses its target, you know, it has uh, a target of minus 20% in 2020, a unilateral target, but it uh, fails that target. Uh, there are pockets of uh, a different kind of life everywhere around the world, in China also, and in large parts of developing countries. But they don't become the prevalent mainstream kind of approach, which means emissions rise, wrong kind of technologies are being used, coal is replacing oil, the worst case scenario, because it's much more CO2 intensive, which means more CO2 is released by burning a certain unit of coal than if you burn oil or gas. There's no structural change, and that characterizes this scenario. And I think that's why many of the business solutions that we are being presented are not only uh, misleading, but they are actually dangerous because they give us the impression that it could be a solution, but it is not. For example, there is not enough oil. Peak oil is one of our issues here. We've got enough gas. It was developed by Nazi Germany. It was um, actually refined by South Africa under the embargo of oil. So South Africa is now leading in the technology. And we can do it. Gasification of coal, coal to liquid, it's possible. And there's enough reserves down there. All with a promise of storage afterwards, clean coal. We just suck the carbon dioxide out of the exhaust and then bury it down there. But it doesn't work and it's not possible with the present power stations, not even in Germany, where they're doing this. So technologies are coal, technologies are nuclear, technologies are big biofuels, big hydro, and no structural change, because that is the threat of renewables. These companies are not against renewables as such. I mean, they don't love coal, they don't love oil. It's just basically what they make the money with. So that's why they are defending the use of coal. But renewables are decentralized, and that's the problem, because they haven't got a monopoly there. And of course, if you've got hundreds of thousands of small investors in renewable energy, their profits are being endangered, and that's why they're against it. So in this scenario, there is no changes to the structures, the basic underlying technological and economic structures of our societies, and that's why it's not successful. And it may actually, and that's the biggest danger, it, temperatures may rise above two, three degrees. So there might be a slip into the first scenario, into the business as usual, do nothing scenario. So what is important to avoid the second scenario and getting to the third? There's no way to get around the fact that the affluent North actually has the duty to support these countries in avoiding a fossil fuel development path. And that means we have to reduce emissions considerably, substantially. Minus 20 is actually not enough. We need minus 30 by 2020 and minus 80, minus 90 in 2050. And we have to make the resources available for them to actually jump, leapfrog the fossil age. This will cost hundreds of billions of dollars. If you look at the ozone problem, it took two billion dollars actually in the course of 10, 12 years uh, that were diverted to developing countries in order to make them 
uh, able to get rid of ozone depleting substances. And we have to support developing countries, the weak developing countries, in adapting to climate change because we are responsible for them. And without doing this, we will not be not only be ethically wrong, but we will also lose their support. And we need their support if we want to be successful. So these three ingredients, deep cuts in our countries and uh, substantial um, uh, support for activities to reduce emissions and to adapt to climate change, I think they are the way forward 